So we continue our discussion of fluids and we're going to talk about something called buoyancy and Archimedes principle and that's also related to the flotation of objects. So it turns out that when you take an object and you submerge it in a fluid, we're going to focus on liquid so I'm going to say liquid, but when you submerge it in a fluid it experiences an upward lift force that's called the buoyant force. And the reason that there is this upward lift is because we know that when you go below the surface of a liquid, that the pressure increases with depth. Um, so in our particular case, you could imagine having a block here and imagine that around it is water and we have placed the block in the water and we are holding it under the water. It, the, the, you can't see the hand that's holding it, but just assume that there's a hand there. And we know that at the lower portion of this block, there is a greater pressure because it's further below the surface versus the top portion of the block. The arrows here represent the forces that are exerted on the block on the sides. Because the pressure is greater at the bottom, there's a greater amount of force at the bottom versus the top, and then on the sides, as you go up the sides, the pressure decreases. Now, one of the things that if you think about forces, I mean, force has direction, and we can look at the sum of the forces that are acting on the block. On the sides, there are forces acting on opposite directions that are exactly equal to one another, so those forces would cancel each other out. But when we look at the up and the down direction, the upward forces from the bottom of the block are greater than the downward forces at the top of the block, and therefore there would be a net upward force on this block. And that's the called the buoyant force, that net upward force, and it's coming from a different in, difference in pressure between the top and the bottom. So just to give a little bit of background, you probably have all experienced a buoyant force before, this, this helpful upward lift when an object is placed in a fluid. So if you have ever gone swimming and you take, um, let's say that you're in the swimming pool and you're, and you're pretty deep in the swimming pool and you decide that you know, you're with your friends and you say, hey, let me hold you up under the water. You can go over to your friend and you can hold your friend up with your arms in the water and float them around and it's no problem at all. It's not very difficult and that's because there's this upward lift that's helping you hold that person um, as they're in the water. Now if you were holding on to that person, you had them in your arms and you wanted to walk out of the swimming pool, let's say you're going to walk up the steps of the swimming pool holding on to the person, as they come out of the water they, um, that upward lift force disappears and all of a sudden they become much heavier. So that's just an example of something that you probably have experienced before if you've, if you've done a lot of swimming. I have a swimming pool at home so uh, this is very relevant in my case. So let's look at um, how we might write down what the buoyancy force is. I am not going to expect people to be able to derive this expression, but I'm going to go through the details just to sort of show you where it comes from. So we just went through and talked about the fact that the pressure on the bottom is greater than the pressure at the top, and therefore the force on the bottom is greater than the force at the top. And so we know that pressure is force per unit area. We could solve for the force by multiplying both sides of this expression by the area, and that tells us that the force is the pressure times the area. So that means that the pressure um, or the force at the bottom would be whatever the pressure is at the bottom times whatever the area of that block is at the very bottom. And the force that's acting at the top would be whatever the pressure is at the very top multiplied by whatever that cross-sectional area is. Now we know that by definition the buoyant force is this net upward force due to the fact that there's a difference in pressure. So basically it's the difference between the force on the bottom pushing up and the force at the top pushing down. So according to Newton's second law we can sum the forces and the sum of those forces would be the force that's pushing up at the bottom and then subtracting off the force that's pushing down at the top. So the negative sign is just indicating that that top force is pushing in the downward direction.
we can substitute in what those forces are. So the force on the bottom is just the pressure at the bottom times the area, and the force at the top is just the pressure at the top multiplied by the area. Both of these expressions are multiplied by the area of the block, and so I can factor out that area. And I have that the net force, this upward force, which is from this difference in pressure between the bottom and the top, and is, is our buoyant force, um, is just the difference in pressure times the area. Now the difference in pressure between the bottom and the top is related to the fact that you've gone some depth below the surface. So whatever the depth is or the height of this object is right here, that's the difference between the top and the bottom. And we know that pressure between the bottom and the top, the liquid pressure um, between those two positions is just depends on the density of the fluid times gravity times the depth difference between the top and the bottom and that's the difference in pressure, and then we could multiply that by the area. So what we realize in this picture is that we have area, which is this cross-sectional area at the top, multiplied by the height of this block. So the height times the length times the width, right? Length, length times width is the area here, multiplied by the height is just the volume of this block right here. So I could rewrite this as the density of the fluid, the height times the area is the volume of the block, and then I have still gravity in my expression. So we remember back to our definition of density, and we realize that if you take the density of something and you multiply by its volume, it gives you the mass. So the density of the fluid multiplied by the volume of this block right here is just the mass of the fluid that would take up the same exact space as this block does right here. In other words, um, when we place the block in the fluid, water or the fluid is displaced and the amount of the block that goes below the surface is the amount of, is the same amount of the fluid that is displaced, and we're measuring the mass of that fluid that is displaced by taking the density of the fluid times the volume. So by definition, the buoyant force on an object is equal to, we can replace the density times the volume with the mass, so it's equal to the mass of the fluid that's displaced times gravity, well, mass times gravity is just the weight. So I've gone through this in detail. I've sort of shown a little bit of a proof of where what the buoyancy force is. And the main thing that we need to get out of this is that in general, if you place an object in a fluid, that object will experience an upward lift force. That upward lift force comes from a difference in pressure between the top of the object and the bottom of the object. And that particular upward lift force, that buoyancy force, is always equal to the weight of the fluid that you displace by putting the object in the water or in the fluid. So we're going to look at some examples and this will become hopefully a little bit more clear. So here is a, a, a GIF animation um, and this is actually called Archimedes Principle. So Archimedes' principle says that the buoyant force on an object is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. So in this case, it's water. So a submerged object is always buoyed upward by a force that's equal to the weight of the fluid that it displaced. So in this particular picture, um, as the object is slowly submerged, more volume is displaced and the buoyancy force becomes greater. So when it's completely out of the water, it weighs seven pounds. As it is slowly submerged, water spills out. And if we measure the weight of the water here, we measure that weight that spilled out to be three pounds and that three pounds of water is exactly equal to that upward lift. And because there's an upward lift of three pounds, 
the weight has decreased or the scale only reads four pounds. So when it's out of the water, the scale reads seven. When you place it in the fluid, there's an upward lift force that's equal to the weight of the fluid displaced of three. And so the scale reads a difference of four. It seems to weigh less when it's placed in the water due to this upward um, buoyant force. But the main thing here that's really important is that if we put the object in, fluid is displaced and comes out, and the amount of that fluid that comes out is exactly that weight of that fluid is exactly equal to the buoyant force. So the buoyant force on an object is always going to equal the weight of the fluid that's displaced by the object. If you completely put the object in the fluid, then the volume of the fluid displaced is equal to the volume of the object. So the larger the volume of the object that's submerged, the greater the buoyancy force is going to be because more volume of fluid will be displaced as more of the object is submerged. So a partially submerged object has less of a buoyant force as compared to a totally submerged object. Right? So an object that's only partially submerged does not displace as much fluid as when the object is totally submerged, and thus it experiences the greatest buoyancy force when it's totally submerged. So this is often a, a difficult subject for people. Um, and so we're going to look at some examples, but we're also going to look at a FET simulation to see if we can explore this concept a little bit more. Um, so before we look at the FET simulation, let's, um, let's just think a little bit about this idea of the buoyant force. So suppose that I take a sub an object, I submerge it, and I know that when I submerge it in a fluid that there's going to be an upward lift force, and that force is equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced, that's called the buoyant force. The buoyant force is always going to be present when you place an object in a fluid, but the effect of that buoyant force is going to depend on a number of things. It's going to depend on the fluid, and it's going to depend on the substance that you actually submerge. So let's just talk about this for a minute. So I have this irregular shaped object and I place it in a fluid. And I want to know what are the forces that are acting on this object. Now maybe I'm holding this object under the water and my hand is not shown. So I'm just looking at the forces other than my hand that are acting. And so of course, this object right here has a force of gravity, which is pulling, pulling it downward. But because it is submerged in the fluid, there's also this upward buoyant force. Now, suppose that I put this object, I placed it underneath the fluid. Let's say it's water. It's just easy to say water. Suppose I place this object in the water. There's two things that can happen. I can hold it under the water and I can let it go. And if the buoyant force is larger than the weight of the object, then the force upward would be greater than the downward force. And when I release it, this object is going to want to move up to the surface and it will begin to float. So when the buoyant force is greater than the weight of the object, the object is going to float. This is if I totally submerge the object. The other possibility is I hold this object under the water and I let it go, but the force of gravity or the weight, this value downward, is greater than the buoyant force. And if the force of gravity is greater than the buoyant force, or the buoyancy force is less than the force of gravity, then the object is going to sink. So in both of these examples, for this particular shaped object, the volume is the same for both of these cases. Um, and perhaps, and, and so what does that mean? That means the buoyancy force could be exactly the same for both of these cases, but maybe the weight of the object is different. 
And so um, based on that, different, uh, this, this can have a different impact. So uh, same size object is placed in this liquid. If the, and so the buoyancy force would be the same, but, the, but based on the weight, different things will happen. So let's go to the FET simulation and let's see if we can examine sort of what's going on here. So we're gonna keep the mass of both of the objects, we're gonna have two objects the same, and we're gonna see different results. Um, and then we're gonna keep the volume of both objects the same, and we're gonna see different results. So let's go ahead and let's go to that buoyant, um, the buoyant force um, FET simulation. So we are using the FET of density and buoyancy, I guess it's actually the buoyancy um, FET simulation, and I am in the buoyancy playground, and I have chosen to have two blocks. So what I want to look at is I want to look at, um, first of all, we have two identical blocks. I have a wood block and I have a, uh, a brick, and I've set their volume so that their volumes are exactly the same. So the very first thing I want to do is I'm going to take the brick block and I'm going to completely submerge it in the fluid. And I notice that the amount of fluid that's displaced, okay, so there it was at 100 liters, now it's 105. So the volume of the fluid that's displaced is five liters, which is exactly the same volume as the brick. I can do the same thing with the wood, and I'm actually holding the wood under the water here, I'm holding both of them, and it's also five liters. So I'm going to go over here where it says to show forces, and I'm going to show the gravitational force, and I am going to, I want to put the force value, values, and I am also going to show the buoyancy forces. So the first thing that we look at and we realize is that um, the brick has, um, obviously has a larger mass, and so it has a weight that's equal to 98 newtons, and the um, wooden, block, which has the same volume, has the same, or has a, a weight of only 19.6. So I'm going to take and I'm going to slowly um, submerge the brick, and as I slowly submerge it, I notice that there is a buoyancy force, and the buoyancy force continues to get bigger the more volume of the object gets submerged because there's a greater volume of fluid displaced. Now eventually when it's totally submerged, right, then I can move it around anywhere in here and I'm not displacing any more fluid and so the buoyancy force stays the same. So one of the things as we look at this is if we look at the buoyancy force which is in pink, the upward force is 49, the downward force is the force of gravity, it's 98. The force of gravity is greater than the buoyancy force so when I release this block, is going to sink. So that's what we would expect to happen. Right? Brick is, is pretty dense. On the other hand, I'm going to take the wooden block and I'm going to go through the same process. Um, let's do this real quick. So let's remember what was the buoyancy force. The buoyancy force was 49 newtons um, when the block brick was totally submerged. So now I have the same volume of this, the wooden block. I'm going to slowly submerge it and as I submerge it Right? The buoyancy force keeps getting bigger and I'm pulling it down and pulling it down. Eventually when it's completely submerged, it has a buoyancy force of 49 newtons. I've displaced, oops, can't move it, uh, I've displaced um, the same amount of fluid in this case as I did with the brick. They both displaced 5 liters and 5 liters of water weighs 49 newtons. And so the buoyancy force on this wooden block is the same as the brick because they have the same exact volume. Now, the difference is, is that the buoyancy force on the wooden block is, the upward force is 49. The force of gravity downward is only 19.6. So the buoyancy force is greater than the weight and so if I let go of this block, it's going to go to the surface and it's gonna begin to float. Now, take note of what's happening now as it floats. What's true about the buoyant force as compared to the weight of the object? Hopefully you notice that when an object is floating, the buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the object.
All right, let's take that out. And let's now have them both have the same mass. So let's make the brick have a mass of two kilograms. All right, so because the brick is more dense, that means that if I have equal masses of two substances, the object that has a greater density is more compact. So it's going to, that mass is going to fit in a smaller amount of space. So now if I take that brick and I place it under the fluid, it has a smaller volume and so the buoyancy force on that object is less. So I'm now only displacing one liter of water and therefore the, um, uh, the buoyancy force is smaller than it was before. It's 9.8. Now the force of gravity is still bigger. The force of gravity on this brick is 19.6. So they both have the same force of gravity because they have the same mass, right? Both have the same force of gravity. The brick is more dense, but when I put it under the water, its force of gravity is still greater than the buoyant force, so it's still going to sink. And of course, over here, when I submerge this, right, um, it's going to experience a larger buoyant force because it has a larger volume. It displaces more fluid, so it has the same you know, 49 Newton buoyant forces before, and then when it gets up and I let it go, it's going to float as it did before. Let's, uh, we'll, we'll come back to another example with this a little bit later. All right, let's see if we can apply what we learned from the FET simulation. So the same volume of silver, which has a density of 10.5 grams per centimeter cubed, and gold, which has a density of 19.3 grams per centimeter cubed, are placed in water, which experiences a greater buoyant force. So I take equal volumes of silver and gold, and I separately place them in water. Since they both have the same volume, when I place them each in the water separately, they will displace the same amount of water, just like the brick and the wooden block. And so if they both have the same volume and they displace the same amount of um, fluid, they will experience the same buoyant force. So same volume displaces the same amount of fluid. The buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the fluid that's displaced. So both experience the same buoyant force because you displace exactly the same amount of water. Same type of question, except in this particular case, I have the same mass of silver as I have gold and I place them in water, which experiences a greater buoyant force. So this is again, very similar to the wooden block and the brick. And what we found is that if you have equal masses of these two substances, the substance that has a larger density is more compact, which means you can fit more mass in a given volume. So if I have the same mass of silver as gold, gold is going to have a smaller volume. And so it will experience a smaller buoyant force. Or another way that we can say this is we know that volume is related to density. They are inversely proportional. So the mass for both of these is kept the same. And so as the density of a substance goes up, the volume has to, excuse me, I'm saying this backwards. As the density of a substance goes down, the volume has to go up. So, you know, density measures compactness. So something with a small density is not very compact. compact. It takes more space to fit that mass in. So that means that silver, which is less dense than gold, will experience a greater buoyancy force because it's like similar to the wooden block, right? It takes up more space. Same masses, silver takes up more space than gold.